So now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for a time of meditation. I invite you to find a comfortable position in your seats, close your eyes if you wish, and take a few deep breaths. And let go of any distractions or worries that may be on your mind. In the silence There is a sacred place A secret meeting place Love is there In the silence Where every color blends Deep, deep, deep breath in and hold it for just a moment. Hold it for just a moment. And when you're ready, let it slowly exhale. Slowly exhale and let that breath out and settle in. Settle into your time. For this is the time when we take a break. When we allow the thoughts to slow down. When we let the experience in this human world go for a while. We just let them go. We let them drift from our mind and invite our divinity to flow through us. Love is there. Peace is there. God is there. Breathing in and Breathing out now, settling down, allowing the thoughts to still themselves, allowing our body to relax, taking in a deep, deep breath again, and holding it for a moment and letting that energy move through the body, and then slowly letting it out, and dropping the shoulders on the exhale, dropping the belly allowing the jaw to relax, allowing the thoughts to relax. My thoughts, my mind are relaxed and calm. I move slowly towards the silence. I move slowly towards the rainbow, the colors of the rainbow in the midst of the silence. Every color's there. Peace is there. In this chaotic world that we're in, 
where peace is not everywhere. We allow our hearts and minds to move to that place of peace. That place of peace that we remember, that we know, that can be, that still is. In the midst of all that's going on, peace is there. Peace in our hearts and peace in our minds. In the midst of the silence, in the midst of that secret hiding place, we let go for a short time now. We let go and we refresh. We let go and we renew. We let go and know. And know that the universe is open and saying yes to all of our heart's desires. That the universe has everything for us that we want, that we desire, that we require, that we think that we need. This missing, it's all there. And we say yes to receiving it. We say yes in the midst of the silence to allowing our eyes, even with them closed, to be open. For, our, uh, for we open our eyes to God and allow the universe, allow God, allow spirit, allow the one presence and the one power to flow through us. And we see, and we see that love. We know love. We see that peace. We know peace. We see God. We know God in the silence, in the silence. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Knowing that we are made in the image and likeness of the one presence and the one power. That we are a beautiful child of God, each of us, in every way. Knowing that in this human experience, there is not one spot where God is not. Slowly coming back to this present moment now, wiggling the fingers and wiggling the toes, licking the lips to moisten them and shrugging the shoulders up and down and turning the head from right to center and to the left and back to center and slowly allowing the eyes to come back open, we say, thank you, God. 
Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. When I was a boy each week On Sundays we would go to church And pay attention to the priest He would read the Holy Word And consecrate the Holy Bread Everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything is holy now Everything, everything, everything is holy now. When I was in Sunday school, we would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two. Jesus made the water wine. I remember feeling sad that miracles don't happen still. But now I can't keep track because everything's a miracle. Everything, everything, everything's a miracle. water is not so small but an even better magic trick is that anything is here at all so the challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles but finding where there isn't one When holy water was rare at best, it barely wet my fingertips. But now I have to hold my breath like I'm swimming in a sea of it. It used to be a world half there, hair the second rate hand me down. But I walk it with a reverent air. Cause everything is holy now Breathe A questioning child's face And say it's not a testament That'd be very hard to say See, see another new morning come And say it's not a sacrament I tell you that it can't be done This morning outside I stood I saw a little red winged bird Shining like a burning bush Singing like a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out How things have changed since then Everything is holy now It used to be a world half there Heaven's second ray hand me down But I walk it with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now The music ministry of David Trolley. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you.
looking for a miracle where there isn't one. Will you join me in that? I invite you. I invite you to spend your day today looking for a miracle where there isn't one. We're going to find out that Nehemiah certainly was looking for a miracle where there wasn't one. As a matter of fact, most of the Old Testaments are stories about looking for a miracle where there isn't one. But before we get into that this morning, I want to talk a little bit about what's coming up at Unity of Davis. Yes, at Unity of Davis. Uh oh, I said Unity of Davis, and that's because the Board of Trustees at its last meeting voted to drop the word center from our name. Well, we don't really have a center. We we're, we're, don't have a physical location. We're virtual. So we're becoming Unity of Davis. And beginning January 1st, we're filing the papers and we'll be known as Unity of Davis. So God bless Unity Center of Davis. Thank you for all the years that you've been Unity Center of Davis. And, and we're, we're, we found a miracle. We're Unity of Davis now. So thank you, Board of Trustees. And then next week, Harry O and I get to present the service, and I'm excited. I, I, John Duffy shared, I remember John Duffy a couple of years ago as president was talking about Casey at the bat. Do you remember that? And getting back to basics. And Harry and I are going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about kicking off the pledging campaign and about the four qualities, the four qualities of life, the four qualities that we need to exist in this human experience. The Earth Care team is hosting Sylvia Hayes again after that. So we're celebrating Earth Care on November the 12th, I believe it is, and she'll be here to provide Sunday service. And then I really wanna encourage you to attend the Gratitude Circle at Donna Twelbridge's. It's just a, a fun event nice and fun food and good conversation, great environment. Thank you, Donna, for opening up your home to us again this year. And then, well, <laughs> look out, it's Advent. Christmas is around the corner. Yes, the Christmas stores are open and we can be shopping, even though the Halloween, Halloween still hasn't happened. It's Christmas coming up. And so, Advent's coming and we'll be celebrating Advent. And we'll also be celebrating Advent on December 10th when we do both an in-person and virtual service. We'll be doing our last in-person in service at the Davis Senior Center and join us either virtually or in person. And don't fear if you're joining us virtually, you're gonna be a part of the service. We're looking forward to doing this hybrid service together. So come and join us and you know, one of the other things about doing a uh, in-person service again, I've been getting the opportunity to work with Mary on putting together a church bulletin. And I'm gonna need your help because we better keep an eye on Mary. You know, you know how there can be bloopers in church bulletins, don't you? I mean, you've seen them, right? Well, Mary, we don't want any church. Well, maybe we will take a church blooper or two, but. Here's a couple of church bloopers for you this morning that I found, okay? So the first one is, it disappeared in a, in a bulletin. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. Number two, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Next, oh, this is a good one. <laughs> The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They can be seen in the church basement Sunday. Thursday at 5 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. All ladies wishing to become little mothers will meet with the pastor in his study. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, and, and this one, oh my goodness, during the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon from E.J. Stubbs. <laughs> I, I, we don't need any of those comments here. <laughs> at, at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to the choir practice. Uh-oh. <laughs> and 
it's not Easter, but in the bulletin, it said, this being Easter Sunday, we will ask Mrs. Johnson to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. Well, there we go. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. So Mary, be careful. No church, no bulletin bloopers, okay? Well, it's it's been a fun series uh, on stories from the Bible, uh, looking at the New Testament and the Old Testament. And, and uh, you know, the Old Testament is all about the history of the Jewish people. The history of the Jewish people. I want to remind you, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, that there was more going on in the world than the Jewish people. There were civilizations all over this planet moving through similar similarities that the Jewish people were going through, figuring out who they were and why they were here and what happened after they left here and who was in charge and who wasn't in charge and what could they do and what shouldn't they do and what rules worked and what rules didn't. But in this series, we've looked at a little history of the Jewish people their ver we've taken you know we the Jewish people in the new in the Old Testament we've take we can take a look at their version of the creation story, their version of the creation story, the story of Adam and Eve, the story of the seven days. It's the Jewish people's creation story, which includes the story of Abraham, the story of King David, the exiles, the many exiles of the Jewish people from Israel, from Judea, from the divided kingdom, and the returns to Israel. And, and then we moved into the ministry of Jesus in the New Testament. So this is about the Jewish people. And there were definitely other cultures and other spiritual or religious beliefs developing, developing elsewhere on the planet. Remember that these other cultures were, were developing their own systems. And at the same time that this development of other cultures' systems were going on, the Jewish people were claiming to be God's chosen people. The Jewish people were claiming to be God's chosen people. The Jewish people still claim that today. Hmm. Does that make me not chosen? Does that make me not one with God if I'm not Jewish? Ah, causes a little rift to think about, doesn't it? It causes uh, us to think about exclusivity and inclusivity. So I ask you to keep that in mind because what we're seeing in the world today, right now, today, in the Middle East, is not something new. It's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. I, I hope it will give us some insights into what's going on and hopefully how we can move forward in this human experience peacefully and lovingly and knowing that whatever your path to God is, whatever the face of God is to you, that it's acceptable, that it's okay that it's yours and you get to have it. it. It's it's part of your divinity. It's part of what you believe and desire. As we move through our discussion about this period of time, think about what's going on in the world today and who the players are. You'll see the same conflict as we move through the story. Now, once again this week, and it seemed like you all enjoyed it last week, I'm going to pull up a, a screen. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a screenshot, and I'm going to call it up right now. Can you see my screen okay? So this is a map of the Middle East. Let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Whoops, just one second, bear with me here. Slide show, current slide. There we go. So if you look, you can see what is the Fertile Crescent, 
here's the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, okay, if you can see my pointer. And, and look what's down here. Now, this was in the time of Babylonia and Assyria. The Assyrians and the Babylonians. It's all about our story today, about Nehemiah. But look down here in this corner. There was Palestine. Interesting. And here was Syria, still there today. And ah, uh, do you remember two weeks ago, we talked about Nineveh? Nineveh was right up here where Iraq is today. And you can see that at this time period that we had both Assyria and Babylonia. And the Assyrians had captured quite a bit of of uh, quite a bit of the Fertile Crescent. And our story takes place at the time that the Babylonians took over this area and other areas from the Assyrians. And the Babylonian culture was ruling this area of the country. Of course, then it didn't stop there. And we'll talk about this. Then the Persians came in. Here's the Persians over here, but you can see that people from outside the Assyrian world, then from outside the Babylonian world, they're moving in and they're taking over, just like people are trying to do today in this area of the world. So it, it, things haven't changed very much up here, you can see where Lebanon is, where Jordan and Syria is, or Iraq is. And, and you see up here that um, the uh, you'll remember these names. If you read through the, the, the Old Testament, you'll see the Hittites, the Kassites, the Elamites, the Medes. As a matter of fact, the Medes were over in Israel when Nehemiah came back from the exile. So this is the period of time from about 612 BCE to about 221 BC. It's known as the Axial or the Heroic Age. And lots went on during it, not unlike what's going on in the world today. Just to sum up what was happening in that period of time, and especially between the time of 400 BC and 600 BC, the Assyrians defeated were defeated. In China, it was the Warring State period. Scriptures of Hinduism and Judaism were written down during this period. Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, and the person, persons known as Lao Tse, promote their teachings and philosophy. Pericles and democracy was in the 5th century BC. Cyrus the Great and the Persian Empire. We saw Persia and Persian taking over Babylonian Assyria when, power, when Cyrus the Great was in power. The age begins with the world politically fractured, but ends with the unification by Alexander the Great, Ashoka the Great, and the Quinn Empire. So just a couple of dates, and I, and I don't want to belabor this, but I want to put it in perspective. The Bab You remember we saw the Medes, and I said you'll see them later? The Babylonians and the Medes conquer Assyria in 612 BCE. And also, in the 5th century, we see the rise of empires and religions. Between 600 and 401, the migration of the Jews. In the 6th century, the Babylonians capture Jerusalem. Ah, remember that. The Babylonians capture Jerusalem. And then the exile of the Jews take place. The northern Jews went up into Assyria, and the southern Jews went over to Babylonia. 
because this was after the divided kingdom of the Jews, the north and the south. And when the Babylonians took over and desecrated the temple, the northern Jews went into Assyria and the southern Jews went into Babylonia. And also during that time in 500 BCE, Buddha begins Buddhism. Judaism was fully developed. The Bible was first written. And the Iron Age began in Denmark. The Babylonian cap captivity or the Babylonian exile is the period in Jewish history during which a number of Jews of the kingdom of Judah were captive in Babylon. After deportation to lower Mesopotamia, which is today modern Iraq and Iran, they were taken into Babylon. Babylon. In the late 7th century BC, the kingdom of Judah was a client state of the Assyrian Empire. In the last decades of the century, Assyria was then overthrown by Babylon, which was an Assyrian province. And for Kent and Fran, I now bring up Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, <laughs> who plundered Jerusalem and its temple and took King Jehokan, his court, and other prominent citizens, including the prophet Ezekiel, back to Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, leading the Babylonians, went in and desecrated the temple, and the Jews were exiled to other parts of the country. They no longer had their, their, their land. And if you look through some of the other books of the Bible leading up and around this story of Nehemiah, you'll see that the books of Obadiah, Malachi, and Joel depict a struggling Jewish commun community, threatened from the outside by neighboring peoples and the pressures of foreign culture. They were weakened from within by poverty, discontentment, and religious apathy. And this was the situation when Nehemiah and Ezra appeared on the scene. Now, we're in the post-exilic period or the post-exile period. And the Jews have begun their return to Judah to Jerusalem after being freed from their exile by Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, who conquered Babylon, freed the Jews to go back. So the Jews are back in Jerusalem, not all at once, but little by little by little. And there, and it, when I say this, it makes me think of Gaza. I can't help it. Their, their, their land was desecrated. Their land was, they didn't have bombs, but you might as well say it was bombed out. The, the temple was desecrated. Things weren't as they know them. The buildings were in rubble. There, there was no wall around the city. There had to be a wall around the city for what? Protection. And so no wonder the Jews that were back there were discontent, were disharmonious, were not happy. And so Zerubbabel, Zeru, oh, why do I have trouble with these words? Zerubbabel, the grandson of King Jokian, and you remember we talked about him, and Nehemiah, Nehemiah, both play a part in restoring God's temple. Zerubbabel taking charge over governing affairs, and Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jew Jerusalem. Then Ezra, and it's said that the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah were one time considered one book written by the same person. Then they decided, no, it's completely two different stories. They, they don't give credit to who put those stories down, but that Ezra was a separate story from Nehemiah because Ezra was all about teaching God's laws 
to the post-exile Jewish generation, to the Jewish generation that returned after their exile. So why am I talking about Nehemiah? Because Nehemiah is known for rebuilding the wall. And he's known for rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. In 52 days. That meant that he had to get back there to Jerusalem. And how did he get back there? Well, he heard from people that were coming back to, the ba to Babylonia, to, to, to Persia, that it was a mess in Jerusalem. The people were discontent and unhappy that it wasn't coming together. And this, he was distraught because of this. And he went into prayer and fasting. And he was called by God to do something about it. And so he went to the current king and asked if he could go back and help. And they sent him back there. And so Nehemiah was a leader. Nehemiah had qualities of a leader. And I wanted to talk about Nehemiah because it fits into our ministry right now. And I want to ask you to think about the leadership qualities that you have and that are willing to bring to our ministry because we're in a state of rebuilding, a state of change a state of coming from being a physical ministry to a virtual ministry, uh, a place of developing new kinds of teams, needing new kinds of leaders and new kinds of direction. And so at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about the qualities of a leader. And I know that so many of you out there have these qualities of leadership. And one of the places where I know Harry O oh is looking for leadership qualities. It's on our board of trustees. Many of you in our congregation have served on the board of trustees more than two terms. So what we need, what we're looking for, is those of you who haven't served on the board and have leadership qualities and would be willing to share them, but also new people that can come to the ministry and share their leadership qualities with us. So Nehemiah was a leader. Nehemiah was, before he came to, back to Jerusalem, was a cupbearer to King Adorexus the first at the time when Judah and Palestine had both been partly repopulated by Jews from their exiles. And I've got to tell you, it's not unlike the changing ministry, but so is building the wall in rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. Not everybody wanted that wall rebuilt. Not everybody was for it. There were oppositions to Nehemiah, several sets of oppositions, but Nehemiah went to prayer, went to prayer for guidance and direction, went to prayer for leadership skills and led his people through the building of the wall. So, I want to talk about some of the qualities that le of leadership that Nehemiah brought with him to getting his people together, putting together a plan. In other words, using the power of imagination and bringing the thoughts forward about rebuilding the wall around the city of Jews, Jerusalem, and then having the faith to bring that substance together into practical application, to bring the substance that was already there, he used his imagination to create a wall around the city of Jerusalem. And so Brad Lominick, in who's a writer, and some of his books were the first one he published in April of 2013, was The Catalyst Leader. And then he published in 2015 a book called H3 Leadership. He talks about six qualities of leadership that Nehemiah brought with him. 
And the first one was he was humble. That he ranked high in the kingdom of Ataraxas. He was cupbearer to the king. Yet he understood the stewardship of his role. He arrived in Jerusalem with only the animal he was riding. When he could have asked the king for many more men to help him and escort him back. But he brought humility. He brought humbleness with him. He was compassionate, and he brought that compassion with him. When he learned of the suffering of his people, he sat down and cried, and then mourned for days, fasting and praying for his Jewish brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Surprising quality so far. You thought I was going to say maybe some more, oh, he, he knew how to make a plan, or he knew how to do this or that, but he was humble and he was compassionate and he was also a visionary. Leaders have vision. Leaders are visionaries. I'm a leader. When the pandemic came and, and we had to have a service online, I had to have a vision to bring us there. And I had to lead us there. And there was opposition and learning to be done. And so a leader is a visionary. Nehemiah immediately captured the hearts of his people to help in rebuilding the walls. He was masterful. He was a masterful motivator to show up and to be able to rally the people to work together was an amazing feat. He brought strength and he brought courage. <laughs> When confronted with naysayers and even potential attacks from those outside the city, he held the people together. He spoke with strength and determination and confidence, and even instructed those building the wall to have a spear in one hand and a toll in the other. He brought organization, he was organized, and leaders need to be organized. Nehemiah quickly assembled working teams to rebuild the wall with to rebuild the wall with haste and had people working round the clock to finish the job. Anyone who can lead rebuilding the wall in 52 days has the ability to organize and stay focused on the strategy in hand. And certainly church leaders need to be organized to be able to motivate and and gather our members together to do the work of the ministry, to get to sponsor through stake a five-person family every Christmas and get everything they need on, on, on their and desire on their wish list. That takes organization. It takes strength and it takes courage. And that's a sign of a leader. And it takes organization to do it as well. Nehemiah brought that organization with him. And lastly, and certainly not least, Nehemiah brought integrity. Leadership doesn't work if you don't bring integrity. People see through it very quickly. It can be your demise. When Nehemiah learned of the same way some of the people were being cheated and sold into slavery by others in the city, he quickly brought light to and put a new solution and system in place. He wouldn't stand for the inequities that had been going on for quite a while. And so after Nehemiah built the wall and brought that integrity, he went on to be the governor and led the people. And with the help of Ezra, who was really putting down in writing Judea, Judaic law, they brought post-exilic Jerusalem into a place of moving forward. So I invite you to read the book of Nehemiah. I invite you to Google Nehemiah and take a look at the attributes that Nehemiah brought, to take a look at the attributes of leadership, and, and then spend some time in the silence and See if perhaps you're called to leadership in this ministry.
And if you find that you are, step up, step forward, put out a call to me or another board member or to Harry and say, I'm ready. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. I'd like to serve a term on the board of trustees. Well, that's our series on stories from the Bible. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll do some more of it again. Thanks for being here and thanks for being leaders. So it is. Amen.